Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Rolling Meadows Bible Chapel for our online service. We are going to sing some songs today about the name of Jesus. It's the most important name in the entire world, and it is a name that is very precious to us. And so we're going to sing all of our songs that include something about the name of the Lord Jesus. And so these first two, uh, we're going to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear, and his name is wonderful. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to sing of the wonderful name of Jesus. We thank you so much for Jesus. He is the center of our lives. He is the foundation on which we stand. He is our Savior, our Lord, our friend. And we thank you that we can come and sing and also learn from your word about Jesus. And so we 
pray that you will help us today as we listen to your word to challenge our hearts, to bring us closer to the Lord Jesus so that we might serve him and love him even more. So we give you thanks for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great to uh, be here today, and we have Ron Hughes, who is going to be speaking to us in just a few minutes on the Lord Jesus as the truth. And uh, during the week, we have two Bible studies, one on Tuesday night, one on Wednesday night. Both uh, are on Zoom right now. And then next Sunday, we look forward to having Jim Paul uh, bring a word to us uh, online uh, through YouTube as well. So uh, lots of good things coming up in the next little while. And of course, with uh, lockdown in uh, currently going on, we don't have any other activities that are on at the moment. Uh, but please be praying for one another, reaching out to one another. As uh, a body of Christ, we're still a family. And so it's wonderful to have the opportunities we have, even though we can't meet in person, uh, just to be in contact with each other and encouraging one another throughout the week. We're going to continue to sing a few more songs, three more songs about the name of the Lord Jesus. And this next one is, Lord, I lift your name on high.
for singing along with us today at home and uh, we look forward now to hearing from the word of God on Jesus the truth. Well hello and thank you for giving me the opportunity to open God's word with you today. As we consider this important aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ that he is the truth and we'll be thinking about that uh, for the next 30 minutes or so. 
You know, few could argue with the proposition that we live in dark times. Uh, there's the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, political upheaval, has anybody noticed? Uh, social polarization, uh, the devaluation of human life, and we could go on and on. But as dark as these things make our lives, I would propose that the cloak of spiritual darkness makes everything just that much worse. We might well ask ourselves where the spiritual darkness comes from. And I would suggest to you that it arises from rebellion against God. Satan, the original rebel, is the master deceiver. In John 8, Jesus said he's a liar and the father of lies. Now, that suggests to me that every lie that has ever been told by anyone uh, really has Satan behind it at some level. And whenever we believe a lie of any kind, we are deceived. And the idea of deception has strong links to that idea of darkness. Now, when the power goes out at night, leaving us in darkness, we're affected in several ways. If we attempt to move around, we might bump into things and hurt ourselves. As some of you will know who Frank Webb is. Uh, Frank was my prayer partner at FBH International for many years, and one time we had experienced uh, a nighttime power outage, and he asked me uh, how we had managed, and I told him, well, I sort of was just feeling my way around and uh, somehow managed to do what I needed to do. And he said, don't do that. Uh, and I questioned him about that, and he said he learned the hard way, that when, you, when you're feeling with your hands like this in the dark, what happens is... Uh, you can, you can hit an obstacle that comes straight down the middle. He himself had actually collided with a door, the edge of a door one time. So he said he always crossed his arms. And that way, if he confronted an obstacle, his, his arms would hit it before it hit him in the face. Um, <clears throat> we also might uh, do some damage. We could we can knock things over as we as we feel our way around in the dark. And it's possible we might even accidentally hurt somebody else who is also floundering around in the dark. So if uh, moving around in the dark is dangerous, how about staying still? Well, yes, that that's fine, I suppose. But if we stay still, we can't do the things we usually do. We can't be productive. We can't work. Uh, we can't pursue hobbies. Uh, we can't even put together a decent meal. Um, and some people can't even relax because the darkness makes them anxious. And in many cases, uh, darkness takes away our confidence. Uh, we feel vulnerable and often afraid. And there are spiritual parallels to each one of these things. But before we consider them, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who illumines that word to our minds. And we pray that as we spend this time together now, thinking about our Lord Jesus Christ as the light, the truth, we, uh, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive that which you have for us. And we pray in his name. Amen. Not so long ago, we celebrated Christmas and the coming of Jesus into the world. And his coming to be the Savior of the world brought light to us. Matthew reminds his readers that Isaiah had prophesied about this, and Jesus himself referred to his role as the light. Here are just a few verses that you'll probably be familiar with. In John 3, 19, Jesus said, The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. A few chapters later, in John 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in John 12, 46, he said, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Now, we've got a couple of parallel things happening. If darkness represents deception, that is, physical darkness represents spiritual deception, then light, physical light, represents spiritual truth. And Jesus is the truth. Indeed, several verses associate Jesus with the truth. For example, in John 1, 17, 
For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then perhaps the most famous verse of them all in regard to this, uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then if, again, a few chapters later in, in chapter 18, verse 37, Jesus told Pilate, for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So taken together, these passages reveal Jesus as the truth and the light. And this is really the big idea of this whole presentation. So it bears repeating, <laughs> Jesus is the truth and the light. Now, we're going to consider some verses from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I remember as a little boy learning these verses in the King James Version, and I had no idea what it meant when it was referring to the light and it said, the darkness comprehended it not. What did that mean? The darkness comprehended it not. So I did some digging. <laughs> uh, not when I was a child, by the way, this was much later. And in both Hebrew and Greek, the words translated comprehend uh, have two aspects which we find uh, in the everyday word grasp. Now, you know that grasp can mean mental or spiritual perception. Do you grasp what I'm getting at? But it can also mean to, to hold on to something or to contain it. And we can say that the darkness can neither understand the light, nor can it get hold of it and contain it. Or as the ESV, which we just read, says, the darkness has not overcome it. And this is significant. It gives us great hope and assurance as we trust in Jesus in the midst of a spiritually dark environment. No matter how dark things are, the light always wins. Now, picture yourself in a windowless cellar. This is really easy for me because we have one in our house. I can't imagine anything darker. Uh, when I've been down there and someone turns out the light at the head of the stairs, it is completely, paralyzingly black. The amazing thing, though, is that even a feeble source of light changes everything. You know, I take out my cell phone, fire it up, and the light from the screen allows me to make it safely to the stairs. You see, simply put, darkness cannot exist when there's a source of light. And spiritual deception cannot exist when there is a truth source. Here's a lovely little thought. You know, when I'm in my, in my cellar <laughs> in the dark and I, and I light a match or I fire up my cell phone, whatever it might be, the closer I am to that light source, as in the phone in my hand, the better I can see. Spiritually, the closer I am to Jesus relationally, the more clearly I can see spiritual reality. So all of this really points to the necessity for us to be in close fellowship, fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to be wandering far from him because when we wander far from him, the one who is the light, we find ourselves seeing less and less clearly at the spiritual level. Darkness can overcome us and we can be deceived. We're going to be talking about that in a little while. Now, one way to think about darkness is that it is the absence of light. So if Jesus is the light, that is spiritual truth, then darkness, spiritual darkness, is the absence of spiritual truth. In the absence of that truth, we find ourselves believing and acting on lies. And the Bible expands on this by using expressions like uh, deceived, seduced, uh, led astray, uh, and beguiled. There are some other words too. Uh, but we might say that Jesus brings the truth of God 
into Satan's domain of deception. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that physical darkness affects us in substantial ways. Remember, uh, it increases danger when we try to move about and do anything. We could get hurt or hurt others or damage things. Um, it can also paralyze us in the sense of forcing us to be unproductive. We just have to stay still because if we move, we could trip and hurt ourselves. Um, and then the third thing is that it robs us of our confidence and leaves us feeling vulnerable. When you're in a situation, particularly an unknown environment, and it is black dark, you move very tentatively. You might only move your feet two or three inches at a time uh, as, you, as you feel around in the darkness trying to avoid an obstacle. And when people live amid the deceptions of the world, they often get hurt by the lies that they, they live by. And there are lots of lies that people live by these days. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, here's one. Money is all that matters. Boy, we've seen some examples of that, haven't we? Uh, here's another one. Uh, getting more, more of whatever, will satisfy them. Well, for those of, those of us who have tried to be satisfied by getting more, we know that that doesn't work. Here's a very popular one these days. Sexual expression is the most important thing in life. How about that one? Um, how about this? Morality is relative. Hmm. And related to that, each person can have his or her own truth. These are all deceptions. They are not true statements. Not one of them is true. Uh, and the people who follow these ideas are deceived. And because they are deceived, they contribute to the deception of others. And they could harm them, probably unintentionally. They think they're believing the truth, but in fact, they are believing a lie, maybe more than one lie. So when people are in the dark spiritually, um, let's look at those parallels. Uh, they can't fulfill God's purpose for them. They can't be spiritually productive, we could say. That is, they can't grow spiritually because they need truth to do that. And they can't really enjoy themselves. Well, they can get short-term pleasures, true, but a life of fulfillment and joy eludes them. And I can tell you, I personally know some people who have seemed to have had everything going well for them, but they reserve a part of their life. Um, they believed a lie and, and they're, they've fallen into sin. And it, it hinders their ability to enjoy all of life. Um, we could chat about that for a while, but we're not going to. We're going to keep moving. And then another thing is um, people who are deceived uh, spiritually, well, they can't nourish themselves spiritually because all of the spiritual insights that are available in the darkness are deceptions. They just, you know, they, they chance upon some new lie and they say, oh, this is wonderful. This, will, this is going to help me. And they believe it. Well, they're just more deceived than ever. And then another thing is that people are often feeling vulnerable and afraid. Um, there are lots of people these days who, who struggle with fear. They have no confidence in the future. Um, they just hope, hope against hope, that God doesn't exist and that there will be no final reckoning because they are deceived into thinking they can live as they want, act as they please, and there's no uh, consequence to that. Um, we know that there are consequences to how we live, so they just hope God doesn't exist, and they're clinging to that. However, when people follow Jesus and live in his light, all of this changes. Um, they see spiritual realities clearly. And they're able to set their priorities wisely because of that. Now, I hasten to add, we are still physical creatures and we need to take care of that aspect of ourselves. Okay, I get that. We need to eat and sleep and refresh ourselves in various ways. But we recognize that we are also spiritually alive and need to give attention to that. At least some attention to that. Um, and they not only live in the light of truth themselves, but they're able to bring others to it. So they can fulfill God's purpose for them. 
living in relationship with him, growing in grace and truth, enjoying life to the full. And they lose their fear of death. Now, quickly, I want to say, I don't know anybody who is really comfortable with what we might call the process of dying. Um, you know, we've, we've seen people uh, die. And we know that often it, it's associated with a long period of, of illness, um, maybe severe injury, a lot of bad stuff associated with dying. But the, they've lost their fear of death. Death itself no longer scares us. Um, and then they look forward to being free of the influence of sin in them and on them. And uh, my goodness, I, 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 my Christian friends, most of them at least, would all say that they're so looking forward to being free of the influence of sin in them and on them. Um, you know, I think we can't even imagine what that's going to be like because everything about the world we live in now is tainted by sin. Even, even the precious, most beautiful relationships that we enjoy, they're tainted by sin. Even the most meaningful tasks, tainted by sin. Even the strongest, most robust, young, healthy bodies, tainted by sin. Uh, so it'll be a grand thing to be, uh, to be free of that. So living in the light is a good thing, a great thing. But here's an uncomfortable fact. Even followers of Jesus can be deceived. There are many verses in scripture that refer to that and warn Christians about being deceived. Now, deception has two main results. First is over sin. Here's some examples. Eve believed if she disobeyed God, she would become like him. That always sounds strange when I put it that way. Uh, David, King David, believed that it would be okay for him to use Bathsheba for his pleasure. Now, where he got that, nobody knows, but he clearly lived it out, didn't he? Um, Ananias and Sapphira believed that they would only improve their status in the church if they lied about the proceeds of the sale of their property. And, and you know, that did not turn out well for them. They were both stricken dead. And Simon the magician believed he could buy the power of the Holy Spirit from the apostles. So in each case, these people were deceived and bad consequences followed. They, they, they were deceived, they began to sin, and then the sin brought death. So that's one thing about deception. Another thing about deception is it can make us unfruitful. Now, I'm going to assume that you're all familiar with the parable of the sower recorded in Matthew 13 and Mark 4. So we're just going to look at one pertinent verse. And this is where Jesus is explaining the meaning of the parable to his disciples. So here's what it says in Matthew 13, 22. Now, he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. And Jesus mentioned two things specifically here, which lead to unfruitfulness. One is the cares of this world. And secondly, the deceitfulness of riches. And I think we need to pause and ask ourselves some tough questions. Now, could it be like the people in the parable that the cares of this world and the drive to accumulate this world's good things have rendered you spiritually unfruitful? And this is something you can only answer for yourself. I hope you're not looking around <laughs> at other people, wherever you are, or thinking of other people. Mm, no, no, we have to answer that question for ourselves. I mean, do you find yourself so busy that you have no time to, to give to God for, for fellowship with him or for even meaningful conversations with other people? Um, perhaps it's not so much an issue of time, but of energy. Do you find yourself so worn out that you have no energy left for spiritual things? Now, of course, as I mentioned before, we are physical beings. We need to take care of our bodies. But have we found a reasonable balance between caring for our bodies and caring for our spirits? I mean, some people 
care a great deal about their bodies. They take a long time to get cleaned up and dressed up. And, and, and nutrition is a huge thing these days. I mean, people are very fussy about what they'll eat. They, they, they care a lot about what they put into their bodies. That's all, that's all fine. But sometimes um, we, we can just slide past any thought for our spirits. We don't care about our spirits the same way we care about our bodies. And it's extremely easy to slide into the habit of giving time and energy only two activities related to this temporary natural life. And some of you are thinking, I know you are. <laughs> you think, but we have responsibilities. That's true. People in our lives depend on us for a host of things. Our, our families, our neighbors, members of our church fellowship, uh, workmates, school friends, they all have expectations of us. They all expect us to be dependable. But the question we have to ask ourselves now is, have we found a reasonable balance between those obligations, legitimate as they are, and God's expectations of us? You know, God does have expectations. You're aware of that, right? Uh, our parents have expectations of us. We have expectations of our children. Expectations is a big thing. But let's not forget God. Let's not leave him out of the expectation category. Uh, because he does have expectations of us. We're not going to take time to, to talk about all of those things, but do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. Not everything is of equal importance. And sometimes we have to let go of some good things because God has more important things for us to do. Uh, I'm confronted by this every week. Uh, I could I could spend a great deal of time in my woodworking shop or in my greenhouse, uh, just enjoying myself. Uh, some would say playing. I hope it's a little better than that. But, but those are things that, well, it's all going to be burned up in the end. Uh, and and sometimes I'm I'm just become very aware. Ron, you need to discipline yourself and go and spend some time uh, preparing a message for the folks that you're going to be speaking to on Sunday. You have to stop playing and go to work. Um, you know, cultural values can, I don't know what's a good word, infect us? Can we say that cultural values can infect us and deceive us? And they can make us discontent with what we have. So, so we have this drive to, to get more. And, and, you know, we can spend all of our time and energy pursuing the messages of our culture. And, and three of the big ones are, you need more of whatever. Uh, you need better, whatever you've got. Oh, that's lovely. You've got that. But you know, there's a new one out. You deserve better than, than what you've got. And another one is stay in style. You think of all of the advertising dollars that are spent to, to create discontent in us. And we can easily buy into those deceptive messages and just spend way too much time uh, pursuing those things. All right. So now, how do we how do we take all of this and bring it home? How do we how do we apply it? So the first thing I want to think about is the fact that we do live in darkness, and when we talk about spiritual darkness, we're talking about deception. And yes, Christians can be deceived. We see this all around us, and sometimes we ourselves have been deceived. Um, but the truth is that Jesus is the truth. He is the spiritual light. So when we walk in the light or walk in the truth, um, we stay close to Jesus, then he shines his light on the spiritual realities around us. And we can act on that. We're not deceived by the, the deceptive messages that the world keeps throwing at us. And, you know, <laughs> Everybody who's a parent that I know of knows the power of being worn down. You know, the kids want to do something. And so one by one, they come and ask you. And then they come as a delegation and they just keep nagging you and pushing you and, and making the request over and over and over. And eventually you wear down. Well, <laughs> the messages of the world can be like that in the life of a Christian. 
Okay, so Jesus is the light. He's the truth. So now you have to be receptive to the truth that he reveals to you, even when it goes against your inclinations. And I hate to tell you this, but our inclinations, humanly speaking, are lean in the, <laughs> in the direction of deception. We like to hear those deceptive messages because it's what we want to hear. And we want to believe those things. It's true of just about anything and everything. When you really want something, you begin to believe that it's okay for you to have it. I think that's probably what happened with, with David and Bathsheba, for example. Uh, then, along with being receptive to the truth that Jesus reveals to us, we need to be alert to the possibility of deception. That's why there are so many warnings against deception in the New Testament. Verses that say specifically, do not be deceived. Why does God warn us about that? It's because it's very possible for us to be deceived. And he says, don't, don't let that happen. And then you may actually have to ask Jesus to shine the light of his truth into your life. You know, when we are deceived and we're, we're guarding a little area of sin in our life, we don't want Jesus' light to shine on that. No, we don't. We just like to prefer to keep that, that little dark corner hidden away. And we may not even be aware that, that we want that. So I would challenge you to spend some time alone with God and ask the Lord by his spirit to, to shine the light of truth into your life. He may show you some things that you have to let go. He may show you some things that you have to add, things that you've neglected. And then finally, frequently acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of your life. Who are you living for? What are you living for? Some of us live to meet the expectations of parents long dead. I hate to say that, but some people do. Um, some people are, are living for prestige and influence and status in society. Some people live for material things. Um, there are lots of, lots of things people live for these days. But Jesus is the one we're to live for. He's the one who's to be the Lord of, Lord of our lives, the one who's, who's calling the shots, making directions, uh, setting the directions, and uh, guiding us in following them. So, you see, this turns out to be a very practical thing. It sounds kind of theoretical. Jesus is the truth. Well, how can a person be the truth? But you can see now, hopefully after a half an hour, that it's actually intensely practical. It's not just some abstract theoretical idea, Jesus is the truth. No, it makes a difference in your life today, if you'll allow it. Um, we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We, we know we can resist him. And when we resist him, we're resisting the truth. We don't let the light of that truth shine into our lives. So open your heart to him. Don't quench or grieve the spirit. Uh, cooperate with him as he seeks to produce good fruit in your life today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of opening your word together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to do this this way today. And we pray that you would continue to speak to us about this whole matter, that we would continually invite Jesus to shine the light of his truth into our lives so that we can follow him more closely, so that we can indeed, as your word says, walk in the light, to walk in his truth. And so we commit ourselves to you. We pray for your blessing on your people. We pray that you would glorify yourself in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Are you gonna start playing? <laughs> okay, let's try that again. There is no one like. No. Sorry about that. that was... No, it was him. He forgot the extra bar. I forgot the extra bar. Ah. Uh, <laughs> hey, messing up.
lift your name on high. You know what I think we should do? I, think I you totally should messed come up. And do the actions. No. I absolutely will not. <laughs> That's why we put a title slide so you can just cut this right in.